In today's Torah portion, we read the following instruction to Israel concerning Sukkot in Leviticus 23, 42 through 43. You shall live in booths for seven days. All citizens in Israel shall live in booths in order that future generations may know that I made the Israelite people live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I the Lord your God. The Hebrew word here for booths is Sukkot, the plural form of Sukkah. And growing up, when I was a kid, my family, we weren't exactly into camping, so we had an indoor sukkah. We put it in our, we put it in our living room. We would drag the mattresses down the stairs and sleep in the sukkah for seven days and eat in there and make a mess and everything. And then now we have an outdoor sukkah, but we still don't sleep in there. But still trying to observe Sukkot. But here's the question I want to explore this morning. Why do we do this? Why do we reside in booths, Sukkot, for seven days? The answer may seem obvious. It's to remember that we lived in booths in Sukkot while wandering in the wilderness after fleeing Egypt. This is a classic interpretation. However, there is another perspective that I'd like us to consider today. In Sifra, an ancient rabbinic commentary on Leviticus, we read this. In order that future generations may know that I made the Israelite people live in Sukkot, quoting from Leviticus 23.43. Then the commentary reads, Rabbi Eleazar says, they were real Sukkot, literal booths. Rabbi Akiva says they were the clouds of glory. The text here presents two interpretations, two great rabbis of the first and second centuries of the common era. Today, Rabbi Akiva, he's considered one of the, one of the greatest rabbinic sages. And what I want to ask, why would Rabbi Akiva think that Sukkot in Leviticus 23 refers to the clouds of glory? It's worth noting that it's worth noting that apart from Leviticus 23, verse 42 through 43, the Torah never states that the Israelites lived in Sukkot, that Hebrew word. Instead, the Torah consistently reports that the Israelites lived in tents, ohelim, as seen in passages like Exodus 16, 16, 33, 8, Numbers 11, 10, 16, 17, and Deuteronomy 1, 27, and others. In Numbers 24, verse 5, we read this. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. You might recognize this text as it's the beginning of the Matovu prayer. The Torah here, it had two opportunities to use Sukkot. But instead of saying that Israel dwells in Sukkot, the Torah uses the word for tent, O hell, and dwelling, Mishkan. Another significant point to consider is that Leviticus 23.43 literally says that God caused the Israelites to live in Sukkot. God is the one who made Israel dwell in Sukkot. Dr. Rachel Schneiderman makes an excellent point when she, she says, this suggests something a little more miraculous than a basic booth. Given Leviticus 23 uses Sukkot instead of Ohalim, and God causes Israel to dwell in Sukkot, let's explore Rabbi Akiva's interpretation that Sukkot symbolizes the clouds of glory. So in Psalm 18, verse 12, we read this. He made darkness his screen, Dark thunderheads, dense clouds of the sky were his pavilion round about him. The Hebrew word here for pavilion is sukkah. David describes the clouds as God's sukkah. And in Psalm 97 verse 2, it says, Dense clouds are around him. Righteousness and justice are the base of his throne. God was with Israel in the wilderness in the form of a cloud, by day and fire by night. We read, of course, in Exodus 13, 21 through 22. When Israel wandered in the wilderness, God appeared to them as a cloud by day. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from the people. In Exodus 40:34 and verse 38, it says, The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. For over the tabernacle, a cloud of the Lord rested by day, and fire would appear in it by night, in the view of all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. One of the most relevant passages connecting Sukkah with the clouds of glory is Isaiah 4, verse 5 through 6, where we read of Isaiah's messianic vision, where he says, The Lord will create over the whole shrine and meeting place of Mount Zion cloud by day, and smoke with the glowing flaming fire by night. Indeed, over all the glory shall hang a canopy, or an ahopah, 
which shall serve as a pavilion, sukkah, for shade from the heat by day and as a shelter for protection against the drenching rain. Again, here, the Hebrew word for pavilion is sukkah. In this messianic vision, Isaiah describes the clouds which will serve as a sukkah for the righteous on Mount Zion. Rabbi Akiva's interpretation of Sukkot as the clouds of glory, I think, helps illuminate the purpose of Yeshua's coming. In John 1.14, Yeshua's, Yeshua's disciple John writes this, And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. We looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. John introduces Yeshua as the divine Messiah by using Sukkot language of God tabernacling with John and others who beheld his glory. I think here John is referring to a specific event described in Matthew 17, verse 1 through 5. And I want to start by beginning with Matthew 16, 28. Yeshua tells his disciples, Amen, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. After six days, Yeshua takes with him Peter and Jacob and John, his brother, and brings them up a high mountain by themselves. Now he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Yeshua. Peter responded to Yeshua, Master, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three Sukkot here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice from out of the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is really incredible. Yeshua tells his disciples that some of them will see Yeshua coming in his kingdom before they die. And then six days later, he, he fulfills what he promised. By taking Peter, Jacob, and John on a high mountain, Yeshua offers them a glimpse of the coming kingdom. Yeshua reveals his glory to his disciples and is joined by Moses and Elijah. Peter had the right holiday in mind when he offers to make three booths, three Sukkot for them. And as he's speaking, as he's making this offer, the text says that a bright cloud overshadowed them. Here, God offers Peter and the other disciples his Sukkah, a bright cloud. God speaks from the cloud to reveal Yeshua's identity. And this recalls God speaking to Moses through a thick cloud in the sight of the people at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. And it's also reminiscent of the cloud serving as a sukkah in Isaiah's messianic vision. This is what John referred to in John 1.14, that John, Jacob, and Peter beheld Yeshua's glory when he tabernacled among them on a high mountain, a time when they experienced God's sukkah. So returning to the rabbinic debate, Whose interpretation is correct? Rabbi Eliezer, who says that we build Sukkot to remember the actual booths the Israelites dwelled in, or Rabbi Akiva, who says that we build Sukkot to remember the clouds of glory, God's protective and guiding presence? I think the answer is both. In Judaism, traditions hold various symbolic meanings. And by using Sukkah rather than Ohelim, tents, in Leviticus 23, the Torah opens both the literal booths and the clouds of glory as legitimate meanings of Sukkot. So as we dwell in Sukkot today and throughout the rest of the feast, let's remember both the temporary dwellings the Israelites lived in as they wandered through the wilderness and the clouds of glory. Our Sukkot helps us remember that it was God who led us out of Egypt. It was not our own doing. The fragile and insecure nature of these structures communicates to us how we truly are reliant on God. Our Sukkot also prompts us to remember the clouds of glory, the comforting and protective presence of God. It reminds us that God who guided Israel through the wilderness in the pillar of cloud chose to reveal himself to humanity through a Jewish man, Yeshua of Nazareth, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The one Daniel foretold, the divine Messiah who will come with the clouds of heaven, who, is, who, who has come to be with us to die and rise from the dead, to redeem Israel and the nations from sin, and to send his spirit to dwell in all who trust in Yeshua. To conclude, I'll leave you with Psalm 27, verse 5 through 6. For in the day of trouble, he will hide me in his sukkah, conceal me in the shelter of his tent, and set me high upon a rock. Then will my head be high above my enemies around me. In his tabernacle, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, sing praises to Adonai. Hag Sukkot Sameach.